Good morning. Welcome to St. James. It's good to see you guys. Welcome to those who are watching on the live stream as well. I'm glad that you're with us. Give me a couple seconds to run over a few notices, and then we'll uh, jump into the worship service. So first, if you, if you can, fill out the guest books that are at the end of your aisle, and then pass those down so the people next to you can fill them out as well. It'd be great to know that you were here with us this morning. Uh, can, I, can, I do, can I make a cup? I don't usually, this is appropriate for not during the worship service. If I can do this now, make a few uh, thank yous. So uh, Easter, especially the Holy Week, is uh, kind of crazy around here, and there's been a lot of people who've done a bunch of extra work. So I just wanted to publicly say thank you to a few of them. Uh, and I know a lot of you have done a lot of stuff at a lot of different times, but uh, Cheryl's done a lot of work uh, getting bulletins ready. There's a lot of extra bulletins to do with the extra worship services, and I wanted to say thank you to her. Also, uh, Alter Guild, it's kind of crazy for them because uh, they've got, uh, th- th- these are the people, uh, the team of people that take care of the uh, front of the sanctuary here and the decorations and stuff like the Easter lilies and getting communion ready for us. And um, it's kind of crazy going from uh, Palm Sunday, which is one set of decorations, to um, uh, Monday, Thursday, which is another set of decorations, to Good Friday, which is different, and then to Easter Sunday. So they're up here a lot this week, and uh, say thank you to Nick and his team. Also, um, Friday night, for those of you who weren't here, uh, we had zero power. One of the transformers went out, and so we had no power at the church, which was, I mean, we were planning on having a Tenebrae service anyway, a service of darkness, and it just worked out. We were, like, completely in the dark, but um, Alter Guild came up and got candles ready for us so that we could follow along in the bulletins, and we all held candles, and it was kind of nice, a lot of extra work that they did. And then, of course, the musicians. It's a bunch of extra services to uh, prepare for, practice at home for, come together and rehearse for. And they've done a bang-up job, too, like they always do. Again, Friday night, no power, super flexible. They, uh, uh, they made it work, and it was a really, really a beautiful service uh, with the music. And I just wanted to say thank you to them. All right, uh, for today, uh, we have worship service now. And then after this, there's going to be brunch uh, prepared downstairs and... Uh, Uh, we can say thank you to Jen for uh, heading that up and Bob and Marilyn who always end up doing slave labor for her too. (laughs) So uh, thank you to them and uh, for all the good work. But come downstairs afterwards and eat brunch with us and there's going to be an Easter egg hunt for all the kids and there's a a ton of Easter eggs. So um, join us for that and then uh, no discovering Christianity class tonight. We'll take some time off tonight and you can hang out with your families. Just a quick note about a communion. Um, so uh, we're going to celebrate communion uh, in the back half of the service. Uh, who, uh, who we invite to communion are people who believe in Jesus, who believe that uh, we are sinners that God has saved by the death and resurrection of his son. Uh, if you believe that Christ is present in communion, all of Jesus for us, you are welcome to communion as well. If you have questions about this or are concerned about what that means, You don't have to take communion. It's okay. You can come and talk to me. But if you believe those things, you are welcome to take communion with us. And um, we'll do that right after the sermon. Uh, Okay, I think that's all I have by way of notices. Let's go ahead and stand and we'll begin. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is risen
Let's continue in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared. Since we're gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let's first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we've sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I announce the grace of God to all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. You may be seated. Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is a terrific resurrection psalm. It gets quoted a couple times in the New Testament. Once in Acts 2. By Peter who is saying, Jesus is the one that Psalm 16 is talking about. It couldn't be David. David's tomb is right down the street. But Jesus doesn't have a tomb. God never let his body decompose. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to shale, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Christ. 
wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We've waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that's with me, whether, it was that, whether then it was I or they. So we preached, and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 16. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Siloam, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's confess our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please stay standing for the sermon hymn. Let us sing praise. 
So let's look at the gospel reading, Mark 16, and let me talk about that for just a few minutes this morning. This, of course, is, uh, most of you know this, this is the thing that separates Christianity from every other religion and worldview in the entire world. It's the only system, it's the only value system that doesn't end in death. Every other system does. Every Eastern religion acknowledges death, in fact, embraces it. Western materialism, that's all that there is, is death make money, have a house, you live a life, and then you pass it on to your people behind you and all that's left are are memories. Everything that we value lives, we value it, it dies, it goes away. It could be your favorite sports team, it could be your favorite musician, it could be your favorite Roth IRA account. It's there, it goes, it's gone, and it's a footnote to history. Jesus is the same way, he's a footnote to history, except for the resurrection. He's just a line in Josephus, unless he rises from the dead. And if he rises from the dead, and that means that death doesn't beat certain things, namely him, then this is the most important thing in the entire universe. And what I don't want us to do is what the temptation for all of us to do is, is to, I'm talking to Christians now, those of you who are Christians, is to to celebrate the resurrection And then to step away and go back to life as it is on Monday morning, like normal, where the gods of this world still reign supreme, where pleasure and money and power are still the goals that we're all to seek, as if the God of the universe didn't become a human being and die and rise from the dead and change everything completely upside down. So this is, we're sitting inside of a sacred space and we're with many of you are Christians, not all of you I know. The temptation is to, well, let's do the Christian thing here, and then we'll go home, and we'll, you know, eat food with the family, and maybe watch the baseball game, and then go about life as normal. And I just want to try to convince you this morning from Mark 16 that there is no life as normal except for the resurrection. That is the normal. Everything else is fake. Everything else is unreal. I'm not saying it's not important. Money, sex, and power are wonderful gifts of God. But ultimately, they have no more power to satisfy us. Only the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the thing that never dies. Everything else comes and goes. So let's talk about the resurrection of Jesus, of course, this morning from Mark. We have four different accounts of Jesus' resurrection in the Gospels. They're all unique. I'll I'll, I'll mention that briefly in a few minutes. Mark's is definitely unique because Mark's is way darker than many of the others. Like we read it this morning, Mark's is not that celebratory. Mark's is... uh, it ends with the women fleeing from the tomb with fear and trembling. It's not this big, oh, yes, Jesus, we're so glad you're back. There's none of that. There's fear and confusion. And what I want to talk to you, the first point is going to be about how 
the resurrection of Jesus, if we, if we come face to face with it like the women in the Gospels did here, it reduces us, it makes us smaller, it diminishes us, it humbles us. It does make us afraid when we really see it for what it, for what it is. It does confuse us. If it doesn't confuse you, then you've not really understood it. It can't be tame. It can't be sort of commodified. It can't be turned into a cute emotion that we do after Good Friday. It's something powerful that cuts right at who we are and the hopes and dreams that we've had. It also does, does other things. But the first thing that the resurrection of Jesus does is it, does, it reduces us. It makes us smaller. And, and those two words, fear and confusion, are kind of what the women experience here. And I want to focus on that in this first point here. First of all, uh, fear. Look at verses 1 through 3. And, and I'll explain a few things about uh, the text as we go along here. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. This is uh, actually normal Jewish burial practices. Um, uh, maybe I've told you guys this before. The Jews didn't bury their dead in a hole in the ground uh, initially. The Jews buried their dead in um, an easily accessible rock hideaway, cave, because in that climate, it was going to take two years for that body to decompose. And after two years, they would go back into that. They would roll the stone away. You can still find these kinds of uh, tombs all over uh, Israel today. You'd roll back the stone, and you'd go in, and you would collect the bones after all the flesh had been decomposed. You would collect the bones. You would fold them up into a little compact ossuary box, and that's what you would bury. There's not space to have, like, you know, big coffins so they would bury them, but you had to do this initial two-year phase where you would put the body, let it decompose, and then you would go back in there and get the bones. Because of that, anointing the body was important. It was an act of devotion, of course, but there were, there were going to be other people who were going to come into this, you know, Jesus dies, they put him at, this, is, this was the plan, you put him in this tomb that uh, Joseph of Arimathea owned, um, you're going to roll the stone back. In a few months, Joseph of Arimathea's aunt might die. And she's going to need to be buried there too. And so you're going to have to go back in there. And if it's a couple months on and there's a dead body in there, it's not going to be very pleasant. So you would go and you would anoint him as a courtesy to the people who are going to have to bring the next dead body in there to lay it in there. So that's what they're going to do. Um, it's going to be rough even now in this climate two days on. But they didn't have any choice because he died on Friday night going right into the Sabbath. And they weren't allowed to go and buy spices or go to the tomb on the Sabbath. So they're waiting until the very first thing, Sunday morning, which is the first time they can get there. And even then, what they're expecting to find is a mutilated corpse that had been two and a half days decomposing already. This is not a pleasant experience, but they're going to go do it as an act of devotion because they love Jesus. It's important, too, I'm going to come back to this later, that it is just the women. All of the gospel accounts agree upon this, that it's only the women who are locked in enough on who Jesus was emotionally and relationally, that they would go to the tomb. Part of this point of them saying, so for, you know, verse two, very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Uh, so it's, it's heavy. It's not massively heavy. We go back to chapter 14, or I'm sorry, chapter 15. And Joseph of Arimathea had put it in place. But this, this comment here, it highlights the problem that they have, which is there's not gonna be any men with us to do this. Like, we're on our own. The men have scattered. Jesus' followers want nothing to do with him now. He's politically dead weight. He can only get them in trouble. Being connected with Jesus now is only going to get you in trouble with the Roman authorities. So they've all bolted, except for the women who refuse to abandon him. So, you know, what are we going to do? There's uh, uh, no men here with us to roll the stone back. Verse 4, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back already. It was very large. Now, when, you know... The women are loyal to Jesus, but G Jesus has told them throughout the Gospel of Mark three times, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise from the dead three days later. Nobody gets this. I mean, it's, you know, it's easy to like, you know, armchair quarterback this thing from a distance and be like, well, he told you he's going to rise from the dead. It's not, you know, somebody tells you they're going to rise from the dead, do you believe them? I'm sure they're thinking, oh, what kind of weird metaphor is Jesus using here, resurrection from the dead? 
They're not expecting, you know, they're going there to the tomb with the spices, and the barrier there that they're expecting is to be going to be the stone. That's their problem. How are we going to get rid of the stone? All right, so they get there, and the stone's gone. The next barrier, the next obstacle in the way is there's no dead body. There's no corpse. What are we going to do now? Then the next obstacle, once they talk to the young man here who tells them that he's not, Jesus isn't here, he's risen. The next obstacle is the real obstacle, which is they were planning on anointing a body which wasn't going to stay dead in the first place. It wasn't going to stay dead in the first place. And, and the necessary result, of course, is it's fear. This is, this is what happens. This is completely unexpected. You know, the, Mark's point is, they're not going to the tomb because they believe in resurrection. They're going to the tomb because they don't believe in resurrection. And when they get there, everything they've thought about the way the world works, everything, everything is upended and changed because Jesus isn't there. He's risen. They're looking for him in the wrong place. he, He isn't with the dead. He's with the living. Harry and I went yesterday to get our hair cut because Angela wanted us to look nice for Easter. And we were in the shop, and they had one of the talking head news channels were on. And, the, the, you know, they're, they're all doing the obligatory, it's Holy Week, Easter weekend. We have to get, like, Christian people on to discuss Christian stuff. And they had, like, a, a, a preacher on, kind of a famous preacher on, and the, and the talking head was saying, well, one of the first questions the talking head asked him was, like, so what, what's up with Christianity? Like, why are we still doing this? Why am I still interviewing somebody like you on a major news outlet? You're a Christian preacher. When Christianity is increasingly all the more, as as time goes on, it's increasingly irrelevant. It's a dying religion. The churches are empty. The universities have no Christians. These are all exaggerations, of course. It's 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 in the cultural milieu. The universities have no Christians in them. Christianity doesn't influence the political process anymore. We're completely secular at this point. Like, what, 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 why am I even talking to you? And, I, you know, the, the guy had a, a decent answer, which I'm not interested in talking about now. I was mainly interested in the question. Because it's honestly a question, right? I mean, this confuses, this is really kind of troubles a lot of Christians. Is like, we're so irrelevant, we're so out of touch. Why isn't Jesus in the university? Why isn't Jesus on Wall Street? Why isn't Jesus in the political places of power? Well, you're not going to find him in the tombs. He's not in the place where there's death. All of these systems are devoted to death. They're devoted to accruing power or accruing pleasure or accruing money. And you've got to hold on to it while it's there because you're going to die. And Jesus isn't in the tombs. He's not in the places of death. And it's completely unexpected. And the women don't expect it. And so it freaks them out. And the guy says to him in verse 5, he says, uh, um, so verse 5, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. This scares them. And the guy says to them in verse 6, don't be alarmed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But verse 8, they are still alarmed. It doesn't change the fact that what's happened to them is completely unexpected. They went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. That's the last word of the resurrection story in Mark. They fled because they were afraid. See, you know, what they expected and what the disciples expected was, to, was Jesus to be victorious. Victorious. He was going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to raise the army. You know, Herod was going to raise up a small Jewish force. They were going to repel them. The larger Roman force from Caesarea was going to come up into Jerusalem and attack Jerusalem. God was going to be with Jesus and with his army. They were going to repel the Jewish force. They were going to pull off a Maccabee situation from the 160s. And they were going to establish Judea as a free kingdom. Jesus would be the Messiah. He would sit on the throne of David as a guru Messiah. He would you know, rule politically and militarily. He would dispense valuable wisdom. And then they would be happy and free until they all died later on. But for a while, they would be free. That's what they expected. The women expected it. The men expected it. The Garden of Gethsemane, when it turns out that Jesus is not interested in raising an army, but is telling them to put away their swords, they all take off fling then because, again, fear. The same thing is happening to them now. And they can't put it together, right? The women can't put it together here at the tomb. They They can understand victory, right? Political victory. They can understand defeat. They knew what Jesus crucified meant. It meant that we thought he was the Messiah, but he's not really the Messiah. So let's just go on about our business. But what they couldn't do was put the two of these things together. They couldn't put the two of these things together. 
And you and I are in the same, again, I'm talking to Christians right now. You and I are in the same boat. Like, what is, is Christianity a religion of defeat or is it a religion of victory? Well, here on Easter Sunday, we get in here kind of in our private world, shut the doors and like, yes, victory. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. But then you walk out the doors and in a few minutes, you're gonna think, well, this, what does this matter? Like, no politicians care about us. None of my favorite movie stars or musicians care about us. It's all exaggerations, right, of course. Nobody in the universities care about us. And we don't know how to put these two things together. Like, Jesus is the most important thing of our lives. And if somebody comes up to me and says, I'm, I'm at, you know, at a work party or something, you know, with, with Angela, well, not now, back when she was at the newspaper, and somebody comes and says, hey, what do you do for a living? Like, I kind of have to choke down the words, I'm a Lutheran pastor. Because it's like, why would somebody, it's a little bit shameful, right? You know, like, it's kind of a lame job. So you really don't do anything except take money from people to show up once a week and make them listen to you talk. How does that go to, with Jesus rules the world? He's the king of the universe. Now he is the Lord of all things. Well, it's hard for us to put these things together. And what, what, what frequently comes out of that is me at Angela's Christmas party afraid. I, I, don't know how, I don't know how this works. I don't know how the victory and the shame go together. I don't know how the cross and the empty tomb are both there. I mean, one method we can do is we can say, well, there's the cross. Now it's Easter, we got the empty tomb, and so we abandon the cross. But that's not gonna work because Jesus has called us to take up his cross and follow him. Paul has promised us in 2 Corinthians that we will bear about in our bodies the death of our Lord Jesus so that we can also bear witness in our bodies to his resurrection. Those two things will always go together. And for Christians, there's a little bit of validation here that fear, you should know this, fear is gonna be a part of the game. Following the resurrected Christ, standing at the door of the empty tomb is going to involve this sense of like, I don't know what's going on here, but it's freaking me out. And if we bounce back and forth to try and make sense of them between this private victory and public shame, we aren't going to get it. It's okay to just embrace that they're both there. It's okay to, to say, I am a, I'm a believing Christian. I believe that Jesus, because he rose from the dead, is Lord of the universe in public and to be freaked out by it. Because if the people that you're talking to understand what you're saying, they too will be freaked out. It cannot be tamed. This fear is a part of it. But it does involve a reduction. It does involve me telling people at Angela's work party that I do something that's kind of embarrassing. I'm a Lutheran pastor. Maybe 100 years ago, there was sort of like a little prestige in being a minister of the gospel. Not anymore. It will involve you over the, uh, you, you know, uh, in, in the, 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 the office cafeteria, having to say to somebody at some time, I'm a, I'm a Christian, it's the most important thing in my life. And you will feel fear at that, and it's okay. It's, a part, it's built into the whole nature of the resurrection. It stirs up fear. They're scared because this world makes no sense. It also makes no sense, this is the second part, is their confusion, right? They don't know what to, they don't know what to make of this. There's fear, but there's also confusion. Look, there's no way that they can know what this means. So you have an empty tomb. That doesn't prove anything. Like the, the, uh, Matthew, for one, acknowledges that, that many of the contemporaries were saying, oh, yeah, the disciples stole the body. This is common even 150 years later. There's an um, um, early Christian writing, Justin Martyr. It's a, a dialogue with Trifo. It's, a, it's a, a discussion, a very friendly discussion, too, a discussion that he has with the Jewish scholar named uh, Trifo, and they're talking about the, comparing the two religions, and the Jewish scholar says, well, yes, I know the tomb was empty, but the body was stolen. Even then, there was, no, there was really no question about the tomb being empty, but it doesn't prove anything. You, you also have appearances of Jesus. The disciples saw Jesus, so they claim that they saw Jesus after he rose from the dead, right? But sometimes people have visions of their deceased loved ones. That doesn't prove anything, really. The only way that you can really know about the resurrection is through revelation. And this is why this weird kid in white shows up at the tomb. This is very apocalyptic. It's very book of Daniel, right? They're standing at the empty tomb. They don't know what to make of it. It's very confusing. And then this guy in white is standing there. who says to them, don't be alarmed. You see Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. That's the only way they know. That's the only way they know what this means is that God sends them somebody to say, this is what this means. Look, now look, I'm gonna do, I have to do this every Easter sermon because I know not all of you are believers 
And I know that a chunk of you who are believers are always kind of like, not, not wavering is the wrong word, but like wondering, what, what is, does this make sense? What, what am I believing here? There are things, there are ways to infer the reality of the resurrection, right? I mean, there, there are things that we can do um, historically. It, it doesn't make any sense that these followers of Jesus would make up a lie that they saw Jesus and talked to him after he was killed for no reason at all. It doesn't, you know, maybe if it got them political power, but it didn't. They didn't want anything to do with political power. Maybe if it got him money, people will make up lies and, and like preach lies to get money. That happens a lot, you know, from, from pastors and politicians and car salesmen. People will make up lies to get money, but they don't ever get any money. You know, they, they don't ever get social acclaim. Almost all of them get offed by the Roman Empire in the end. Why would they make up a lie and stick to that lie even when they're told by the empire, you have to quit telling this lie or we are going to kill you? People who make up a lie at that point, you know, you put a gun to my head and say, stop lying. I'll say, okay, I'm done. But they don't. Right? Does that prove anything? No. I mean, you guys, no, I've told you this before. Proof is a horrible, lousy standard for knowledge. You can't really prove anything. You can't prove that Jesus rose from the dead from this, but it's an inference. It's an inference. You can infer, um, you know, uh, uh, testimonially from the fact that all four gospel accounts written at different times in different corners of the Roman Empire, Mark is probably written from Rome, John's probably written from Asia, Asia Minor, Turkey. They all tell the story with weird, very details, like who gets there first, who talks first, who sees Jesus when, and what does it look like? They all tell, it's, all four stories are completely different, which anybody who knows anything about, about taking testimony, I say this every Easter, like any lawyer or uh, you know, police investigator will tell you, like if you get somebody who tells the same story four different ways, detail for detail, any lawyer or police investigator will say, oh, they totally got together and arranged this. But to have basically the same story told with all these varying details is really powerful, I won't say evidence, inference that what's happening here is going back to the one detail that stays the same, which is this guy who was dead came back to life. So one thing they all agree on. And even secular scholars at this point are saying something happened. We don't want to say that Jesus really rose from the dead because that would mean we would have to change the way we live. But... Clearly, historically, these guys thought that they saw the resurrected Jesus and truly believed that they had seen him and talked to him and touched him. So much so that they told stories about this for generations afterwards, wrote the stories down and died believing this. You can infer this too uh, contextually. I had mentioned earlier that the only people that show up in Mark's gospel, actually, the, uh, who's the main characters in the story, Mark 1 through 8? The only characters really are the women. And then the guy, in the, the guy in white. Jesus is not in the story. That's interesting, isn't it? The only characters in the story are women. W women were not considered to be, again, I, I think last year or two years ago, I gave you these quotes from Josephus, which I don't have written down this year. But they went uh, something along the lines of, uh, you know, Jephus, Josephus was the Jewish historian who lived just a little bit after Jesus' time. And, and Josephus said, you, you should not take the witness of women in court. The witness of women is not allowed in court because women are silly and they're prone to lie. These two things. They can't be trusted. Well, that, that was, um, this is not me talking. That was uh, Josephus. That was, the, that was the legal system of the Jews. Also, in the Greco-Roman world, women were not allowed to testi testify in court because they were inherently untrustworthy. Why would the gospel writers make the women the main witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus? This would not have flown in the ancient world. This is definitely sticking their necks out. The only reason why they would have done that is if it actually happened. I'll come back to a payout of this in just a few minutes. There's so really no reason why they would have told the story in this way unless it was what, the way it actually happened. So these are all inferences, right? It doesn't prove anything, but definitely infers it. The only way to truly know it is if God says, this is what it means. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Empty tomb, raised body. I am now victor and king of the universe through the death and resurrection of my son Jesus, which is what happens here with the ladies. Now we can protect ourselves from this. So this is hard. This is, 
Because having to rely on re- revelation, and this is one of the reasons why I do apologetics every Easter, is because I, I feel this burden, and maybe it's wrong. I talked about this on Good Friday, too. I feel this burden to try to give you evidences. And I, don't have, I honestly, I don't have any problem with that. It's, it's legit. It's a way to start the conversation and to think about it. But one of the things that we want to do with evidences is, is to make sense of it so it will fit inside of our heads so that we can understand it. And if I can rationally understand it and give assent to it, then I can believe it. And what that does is it takes the matter of Jesus' death and resurrection and anything about the Bible out of the hands of the Holy Spirit and faith and says, I kind of want to control it. If I can control it, I can be in charge. But the resurrection won't let us do that. It takes revelation to make this make sense. It takes power away from my sovereignty and gives it to him. He's the one who reveals the truth of the resurrection when and where he wills. Like I said, there's ways we can protect ourselves against this. We can do this in a liberal Christian way. We can do it in a conservative Christian way. The liberal Christian way would be to say, well, I personally believe in Jesus' resurrection. I'm not saying that it's true for you. Personally, I believe in it and I found comfort and hope in it. That's a way of saying, I can control it. I won't, make, I won't, I won't do the, 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 the damnable thing in a postmodern world and assume that I can tell other people they should believe it. I'll just say, I can believe it for myself. Well, that's a way of like slimming it down so I can manage it. So it's my belief. I'm in charge of it. The conservative way, and I grew up with this as a fundamentalist Baptist, is I've decided to follow Jesus. Jesus rose from the dead. That actually becomes real and actualized when I make the choice to believe it. God said it, I believe it, and then that settles it. That too is a way to control it though, that the main thing that's happening here is me and my personal decision. Give me the evidences, I will decide for Jesus, and now it's real. Now the resurrection works for me. Neither one of those works in the gospel though. The power of Jesus stands over and above our abilities to comprehend it or to decide for it. It stands over and against our experiences of it. It's much bigger than that. In fact, if I can do one more little bit of apologetics thing here right now, this is a common way to talk about Christianity that's safe out in the world. To to talk about the resurrection as, it's like a metaphor for the power of the individual to new life. It's, when when we read the story of the resurrection of Jesus, it talks about the indomitable human spirit and how we can, all of us, have been given this divine spark and power to really reach out and be who we were created to be. And that's just a bunch of nonsense. That's not, that's, that's not what's going on here at all. So I'll, I'll give you a story. This is a, a piece written a couple of years ago in the Christian Century, which is, a, it's got the word in the name of the magazine. It's a Christian magazine. It was a piece written by a guy named Ross Allen. And the title of the piece was The Mystical Significance of Jesus' Resurrection, where he was arguing for this view. Like, stop it. If you talk about dead people rising from the dead, you're just going to turn off all the sane people in the culture. you got to stop doing that. It doesn't make any sense. Also, it makes Jesus like the Lord. And it takes power and agency away from us sovereign Western individuals. It's very, very un-American to talk about the resurrection because it means that we're not in charge. And he goes on to say this. He talks about how much... Christians struggle with believing. It's hard to believe in the resurrection. He says, our, Paul, St. Paul messes it up, but he ultimately gets it right because he says resurrection is spiritual. This is not true. The guy's making junk up. And not bodily. And then he concludes, it's much more intelligible, Ross Allen says, it's much more intelligible to argue that Jesus' physical resurrection was at its root merely spiritual. That will make sense to, to most people. And the payout is this. Here's what he says. Here's the great truth at the heart of the Christian faith, resurrection. You die, you turn, and then you see. And then you live in this mystical body, which is the blessed company of all faithful people who walk with you on this great adventure of the Christian life, and which will hold you in all your frailty and glory until your life's end. And I don't know if you caught that through all the kind of the pious language, but what he's saying is the power of the resurrection is you believe in this mystical thing that bonds all of us. We're all on this journey, they use a Christian journey together. And that will give us comfort and hope until our life ends. And I'm all for having comfort and hope until your life ends, but that's not what the women are experiencing here. They're experiencing fear and confusion. And the only thing they got is God breaking vertically through into our reality and saying, I just raised my son from the dead. Go to Galilee, you'll see him there. That's all. That's it, but that's enough. 
That's enough to change the entire world. That's enough to convert the Roman Empire with no votes, no political power, no money, no credibility to convert the Roman Empire in 300 years. That's all it took was God saying, this is my son, I'm raising him from the dead. Go follow him. Fear? Yes. Confusion? Yes. Life-changing power? Absolutely. Second thing here, the resurrection of Jesus. Also, it, it does reduce us. It's scary. It's confusing. It does rehabilitate us too. The look at verse 7. But go, the, the, this is what the angel says to the women. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Why does he mention Peter specifically? Why does he call Peter out of all the disciples? A lot of you guys know this. Well, it's just because in the previous chapter, Peter three times told people, I don't know Jesus. I don't, any, I don't know that guy. Don't know him at all. He's over there. I've got my own life over here. Peter three times has abandoned his closest friend in the world, lied about him, and abandoned him. And Jesus, after the resurrection, is going to rehabilitate Peter. He's going to bring Peter back onto his side. Mark chapter 14, he tells Peter this is going to happen. It's interesting. He says in Mark 14, verse 26, this is right after the, uh, the first Lord's Supper. They had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But, here's what he says, after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. So the angel said, he, he's raised, go to Galilee. He told you he's going to meet you Galilee, go to Galilee. Jesus told him before, I'm going I'm to get killed. When I'm raised up, I'll go to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. So we spent the past couple months here at our church thinking about the brokenness of the world, the sin that's eaten away at all of our lives, all of our relationships, all of our bodies, all of our mental health. It's eaten away at it. Ultimately, it's driven God to become a human being, to go to the cross, to pay for this sin. We've been thinking about that a lot. And the question now is, all guilty of idolatry, I think this is, I'm talking to Christians and non-Christians here as well. We're all guilty of worshiping things that don't deserve to be worshiped. God gives us all these good gifts. He gives us friends, he gives us money, he gives us homes, he gives us power, he gives us sex, he gives us all these good gifts, and we turn them into objects of worship and we worship them, thus rebelling against the one true creator, thus becoming traitors against the high king. And what hope is there of any sort of reconciliation when we've abandoned, cruelly abandoned. Look, I have to gulp down the words I'm a Lutheran pastor, even though I get paid to be a Lutheran pastor. At Angela's Christmas party, what hope is there for me to be reconciled to a God who I'm only interested in in the privacy of a sacred space? Think of it this way. What if you had a friend? This is gonna sound like uh, junior high or high school material here. What if you have a friend who was your best friend and you were super close to them. But then you found out that they told people, I'm not really their friend. I mean, she thinks that we're friends, but I'm, I'm really, I mean, I'm, I try to be nice to her because she's kind of lame, but we're, I'm not really her friend. What if you found out that when everybody in the whole workplace or the whole school or the whole neighborhood was against you for some reason that you didn't deserve, that this one person that was, you thought your best friend in the world told people, I, don't come to me. I don't even hardly know them. Like I, yeah, yeah, I hang out with them sometimes. I try to be nice. I hang out with them sometimes. They're not even my friend. Would you be able to forgive that person who did that to you? Now, I, I, this is a real question for, for many of you, if not most of you. This has happened to you at some point in your life. Would you be able to forgive that person? And the, the, the follow-up question here, is, which is even more to the point, is would you be able to eventually embrace that person? Or would you take sweet delight in holding that against them your whole life? Would you train your soul to be bitter against them because the bitterness, at least initially, tasted good? The schadenfreude, the fantasies of them failing and you being able to say, yeah, they abandoned me, I'm glad this is that. Those fantasies running through, playing in your mind deliciously before they eventually just ate away at your, ate away at your soul and dehumanized you. Or would you be able to completely welcome them back? Completely embrace them again. Okay. 
the, the short answer is no, it's not possible. You might be able to do the Christian thing. I made it sound sarcastic. It's not meant to be. And forgive them. But you would never, ever, ever again be able to allow them into your life the way that they were before. But that's what Jesus is going to do with Peter. Why? I mean, part of it is he's God, so he's got all kinds of power to do that. Kind of but the, the main answer is, is because resurrection changes everything. When Jesus rises from the dead, all the sins of the world are gone. When Jesus rises from the dead, all the ways that his followers have abandoned him are no longer important because that was a part of the story to get here to this moment where he's alive and the tomb is empty. He's going to rehabilitate him. He's going to rehabilitate us. Romans 4.25, Paul says this, Jesus was delivered up for our sins, but raised again for our justification. Our justification, our being right with God, our being reunited and reconciled with God, our being rehabilitated in God's family happens at the resurrection. Our justification happens at the resurrection. There is no sin that you have ever, ever committed that puts you outside the bounds. There's no denial of Jesus that you have ever done that makes you unable to be his best friend once more because of the resurrection. Because if he's risen from the dead, it changes absolutely everything, including Peter. You don't get this story completely here in Mark. You can look at the Gospel of John chapter 21 if you want more details because Mark ends kind of abruptly. But Peter is going to be reconciled. Jesus is determined to win him back as his friend and as his lover. The final thing that the resurrection of Jesus does is it doesn't just rehabilitate us, but it also reinstates us. I'll give you three examples, two from the story. First of all, Peter isn't just rehabilitated and welcomed back into Jesus' love. He's also reinstated for mission. He's also given the job that Jesus had been training him for, which he had he'd proven completely unable to do. Jesus is saying, you're back. You're my brother. And now I want you to keep on doing what I've been training you. I'm putting you back on mission. This whole going before them in the Galilee thing from verse 7 hints at this. Mark's not going into too many details here because he's really focusing on the darkness of this. He's focusing on the shock and on the fear and on the confusion. But everybody who knows the other Gospels knows what happens in Galilee. They are put on the Great Commission. Go to Galilee, and I'll tell you more there. Meet me there. And if you read the, the last chapter of uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, you'll see that what happens there is Peter, Peter is given this lifelong mission of discipling others, baptizing them in the name of the Trinity, teaching them all things. Peter is put back on. You are not, if Peter can be rescued and rehabilitated and reinstated, you are not, it is not out of bounds for you. Whatever you have done, you are fair game for the saving grace of Jesus Christ because of the resurrection. You are, you are not beyond the pale. You have not gone too far. You have not burned the last bridge. It's just in your head. It's just a lie that Satan is telling you. The resurrection of Jesus means that you are able to be his child and be back on mission with him. The women too, I mentioned the women earlier, and I talked about this more two years ago. I don't want to hammer this too much. Women aren't even allowed to testify in court. Women are second citizens. Some of you are like, oh, you're playing this up too much, you know, like I don't know, you're trying to appeal to like some sort of like, you know, relevant pro-women conversation. The only reason you would think that, though, is because of this story. If you knew the way the women were treated in the Jewish world, and even worse, in the Greco-Roman world, where they were quite simply sex objects, women had two jobs, to give sexual pleasure to men and to make legitimate babies for their husbands. That was what women were for. They were not to speak. They had no voice. The reason that people, that you and I, and people outside of our culture think that women have rights is because of Jesus. And I'm not exaggerating. This is, uh, Tom Holland says this in his book, Dominion. He's not, he's not a Christian. He's a secular scholar. Historically, this is the only thing. Jesus is, so Mary and Martha sitting in front of Jesus, right? Or uh, Mary is sitting in front of Jesus. Martha's preparing food. Mary wants to hear Jesus teach. Martha comes to Jesus and says, wait a minute, this is, how, this is not how this works. She's sitting where men are sitting. Like she's not supposed to be listening to you teach. That's not for women. She needs to come and help me get the food ready. And Jesus says, you know, no, this is where she should be. She's going to be my disciple. The women here are given the authority of being the primary and ultimate witnesses to the resurrection. The reason why we give women voices now is because of this. Jesus has instated them into mission in places where they had no mission before. Jesus is 
equal opportunity put you to work person. He's able to instate Peter. He's able to reinstate, to instate these women. My final example, and then I'm going to be done, is me personally. I try to tell you this story every once in a while, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story now. But I'll tell you a little, just, uh, I'll just touch on it a little bit. I, I should not be here. I have no business. I have no business standing up in front of other human beings wearing a white robe and holding a Bible and pretending like I have any right to talk about God. I have no business doing this. I'm the worst rebel against God I know. Like I ran from God like crazy. I honestly, I should be dead. I shouldn't even be a Christian. I should definitely not be a pastor. If it wasn't for the resurrecting power of Jesus and the grace of God in Jesus Christ, I would be dead in the way that worked out in my wife's love for me. And in a couple of people I met who were super faithful in their incorrigible desire to disciple me away from unbelief and back to him. If God can save me, he can save you. If God can put me on mission, he can put you on mission. I have no, I have no, if you know my, some of you do know my story. I have no, I honestly, I'm the sketchiest person you've ever seen in front of a church. I mean that quite seriously. I'm the shadiest person that you know who's ever stood in front of you. I don't have any skills except for I know that I'm a filthy sinner and that God has forgiven me. And that's really all it takes. If Jesus rose from the dead, everything changes. And all the lies that you tell yourself about, it's done. I've made my decision. I said this stuff to Angela. I said to her one time, it's done. I'm going to hell. I reject Jesus. I don't want don't to be a Christian. I don't want to be a good husband. I don't want to be a good father. I don't want to be a good friend. And I honestly believed it. I wasn't just trying to push her buttons, although I do push her buttons sometimes. But in that moment, I really did believe it. I was done. There was no way back. All the bridges had been burned. It, how arrogant is that? Like my stubbornness is stronger than the power of Jesus to be raised from the dead? How, how, how self-absorbed is that? Oh, Jesus' grace can't beat me. I'm way too sinful. No, that's not, that's not even close to being the case. If Jesus rose from the dead, everything changed. I read this quote last year. This is cheating. Not that any of you remember this, but I'm going to read it again this year just to close out. This is a quote from N.T. Wright's book, For All God's Worth. He says this, the, me the message of the resurrection is that this world matters. The message of the resurrection is that Aaron Miller, in spite of his rebellion and his sinfulness, matters to God. The message of the resurrection is that Glenn Carbon matters to God. The, resurrection, the message of the resurrection is that you matter to God. He's deeply invested in you, body and soul. That the injustices and pains of this present world must now be addressed with the news that healing, justice, and love have won. If Easter means Jesus Christ is only raised in a spiritual sense, think Ross Allen, then it's only about me. It's about my private beliefs. It's only about finding a new dimension in my personal spiritual life. But if Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, Christianity becomes good news for the whole world. Easter means that in a world where injustice, violence, and degradation are endemic, God is not prepared to tolerate such things. And that we will work along with him and plan with all his energy to implement the victory of Jesus over them all. Take away Easter, and Karl Marx was probably right to accuse Christianity of ignoring problems of the material world. Take away Easter, and Freud was probably right to say Christianity is wish fulfillment. Take away Easter, and Nietzsche was probably right to say that Christianity is for wimps. But if Easter's real, if God has become a human being and raised from the dead, all of us can have new life. The world can be raised again. The resurrection can change everything. The resurrection has changed everything. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us and for being good to us. And for me personally, Father, thank you for rescuing me from myself and from the prison that I had been, the, the, the prison of sin I had built up and around myself. Lord, I pray now that as we come to your rail that you would give yourself to us through your body and son, the body and son and soul of your the, the body and blood and soul of your son, Jesus Christ, in such a way that we know you and know your love for us and are convinced once again of the power of his death and the reality of his resurrection. And we pray this in his name, amen. Hear the bells ringing, they're singing that we can be born.
Please stand for prayer. Let's pray. Father, we, we praise and thank you again for being such a good God and for loving us and for being so committed to us that you would become a human being like us, submit yourself to the death of a slave and be crucified. And that you definitely we want to praise you this morning for rising from the dead to justify us, to give us new life, to in ba being baptized into you to, um, to have a uh, new life promised to us now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we thank you for the way that your resurrection works out in our daily, not, daily lives now. We thank you that we are no longer slaves to sin, and we ask you to forgive us when we go back to those, to, to, to once again allowing our members to be instruments of unrighteousness, when we know that we don't have to, we're not bound to it anymore, that you've liberated us from that. Father, help us to live in the power of your resurrection. Help us to believe in forgiveness, the forgiveness that comes from you in which you empower us through your resurrection to offer to each other. In reconciliation and community, in justice and in love and in mercy, in all these things which don't exist outside of the resurrection of your son. Father, make that what our church and what we as individuals and what our families are known for. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we also thank and praise you this morning for the future ramifications of the resurrection of your son, that you will not abandon our bodies to the grave, that you're not content with just taking our souls to heaven when we die, but that you are determined to raise our bodies up and to make them new again and to fix this world and to make this creation new again. At the promises that you made to the patriarchs that you have paid off in the death and resurrection of your son, and now the force of resurrection in your son is irresistible and guaranteed. Give us hope and comfort, Father, when we're struggling with physical illness, that that's not the end, that our bodies will be fixed someday. Give us hope and comfort when we struggle with relational brokenness, that that's not the end, that in your resurrection, you will reconcile us to each other someday. Give us hope and comfort, Father, in our mental health struggles, that that's not the end, that someday in the resurrection, you will heal our minds and our emotions. Father, help us to have our hope and struggle in you when we struggle financially with worries and anxieties about underemployment or unemployment or about the way things are going in the culture. Help us to know, be, con be convinced by your Holy Spirit afresh that the resurrection power of your son guarantees that all will be well, that you will undo all the bad things and that you will make all things new. 
Lord, in your mercy. We can only pray these things, Father, because you have risen from the dead. Since you've united us to yourself, we too have risen from the dead. And we are with you now, your brothers and sisters, in the throne room of our Father, who's our Father because we've been united to you, our brother. And so we offer these prayers to him through you, through your name, by the power of your spirit, knowing that, Father, you will always answer these prayers according to your will because we are your children and with love. And so we commit them to you, trusting you to answer them in your good timing. We pray this in the name of our brother, Jesus. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation. For you've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But mainly we're bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Passover Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world, who by his death has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Now let's pray together in Jesus' name, the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated.
Grace and pouring out their lives they gave. 
The power that raised him from the grave now works in us to powerfully save. He frees our hearts to live his grace. Go.
Please stand. And now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in Christ's peace. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Christ is risen. Go in peace.